Okay, we're going to start. Okay, welcome to the Lighthouse. Okay, today we're going to do a tremendous class on finding the purpose of life and ending suffering. Ending suffering. Very, very big concept. Okay? I've always told people, you, life is not going to get easier. Life does not get easier. You have to focus on getting better. You have to focus on becoming stronger. It's a common, common theme I have in my classes that if some people are just waiting on the sideline for life to get easier, and it doesn't get easier. It just doesn't get easier. It even gets harder. But if you're able to become stronger, you can handle it. And that's the key to these classes. So again, everything is attitude and perception in life. So that's what we're here to teach you, a different perception on how to handle this. Okay? So the major concepts tonight we're going to talk about is meaning. We're going to talk about a book by Viktor Frankl called uh, Man's Will for Meaning. And we're going to talk about a few other things. Okay? So... Once a person is able to have meaning in his life, once a person finds meaning in his life, that's when all suffering disappears. When a person is able to know that everything's happening for him for the best, that's when he's able to have all suffering disappear. We had that famous example from when the Tony Robbins con uh, conference, that he had a lady who, she was um, molested by, by, a, by a pastor, and she was in a horrible, horrible cult, and she was ready to commit suicide. And until, she came to an intervention and told Tony Robbins said, listen, everything you had to go through, the whole purpose you had to go through is because now you're going to become a therapist and you're going to help other people. You're going to help other people go through this. So now her whole life, instead of God forbid committing suicide, now she had a meaning to live. That meaning all of a sudden gave her tremendous joy and all the past that happened to her completely disappeared. So our job is to find the, our meaning in our life because once we have meaning, everything else disappears. All the suffering disappears. I realized that many of my things that I had to go through in my life, as soon as I realized that if it wasn't for those things that I went through, I would never be the person I am today, I thank God for those things. So it's the question is, is you can't, you, sometimes you're walking into the middle of a movie and you're asking a lot of questions and you don't know what's going on here. But the bottom line is you're in the middle of a movie. You don't see the end. And the key is to have trust and faith in God, to realize that whatever God does for you is, is, is for the best. So, it's a very, very big concept. So it says most people today, they have a means to live, but they don't have, they don't have no meaning to live. No ways of meaning. It's, 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 they have plenty of money, but yet they're the most depressed people. It's people who have full, full of resources, but yet they come into a doctor. How are your kids? Kids are good. How's your wife? Wife is good. How, so what are you here for? That's why I'm here, because I don't know why I'm depressed. Think about it. A guy can go to a doctor, he has everything going for him, Yet he's so depressed, and that's why he's going to a doctor, to, to, to ask the doctor why he's depressed. So this is, it's, it's a clear message that if there's no spirituality, if your soul is not being fed in life, you're going to be depressed. No matter what your financial picture looks like. I don't care who you are. That's why you see the, the majority of people in Hollywood are, God forbid, a lot of people are depressed, and yet they're on top of the world. But at the end of the day, those are the saddest people. Okay? So, again... Nowadays, if a person doesn't have meaning, if a person does not find meaning in his life, what is he going to get? What do you think comes after when a person does not have meaning? It's called, Viktor Frankl called the neurotic triad, which is what? Which is aggression, depression, and addiction. Those are the results of not having meaning in your life. Aggression, depression, and addiction. That's why you see people, God forbid, they turn to, they don't know what to do with their lives. So they turn to these things because there's, there's a lack of meaning. They don't have a purpose for existence. So at the end of the day, there's like, what am I here for? So they turn on to these things. They get mad at the world. Rabbi Machman, now you can see the, the statistics. Look at the statistics of people. 20% of adults will experience depression at some point in their life. You can see 20% of adults. You can see 97% of those people that are they're suffering from depression, their work, home, and life also have, have, have tremendous are getting hit. Don't, don't, don't think that just because you're depressed, you affect just yourself. You affect your family, you affect your kids, you affect everybody. It's, a, it's, it's one of the worst things in life. It says, women are twice as likely to be depressed than men. And it says the highest, listen to this, depression is the highest leading cause of disability in women today. Number one cause of, of disability in women. Okay? One in seven men will develop depression within six months of becoming unemployed. So, look at the trends. Rabbi Nachman says something very nice. He says, depression is like anger and rage 
It is like a complaint against God for not fulfilling one's wishes. That's what he considers. And it causes you, God forbid, to lose your name. You don't get sympathy for this. You don't get sympathy. God forbid, it causes you to lose your name. You know, yo, look at the guy, he's so depressed. Nobody remembers the guy anymore. Nobody remembers the guy anymore. So you got to really change the attitude here. And you got to realize that it's, it's all coming from a lack of gratitude. So let's get to this core before we, we go into the meaning thing. So now we know that those three things, this vacuum is what's costing. When you don't have meaning in your life, you're going to have addiction, you're going to have aggression, and you're going to have all, all these problems, God forbid. Okay? So, again, everybody has to go through some kind of pain. Right? We all go through pain, because without pain, there's no gain. Bottom line, no pain, no gain. You have to go through some kind of pain in your life, but you don't have to suffer. That's the difference. What is the combination, what is the formula between pain and suffering? If you have some kind of pain, as long as you don't resist the pain, the amount of resistance that you do to the pain, for example, if a person is able, he gets, for example, a $5,000 water bill, and he should have really gotten a $50,000 damage somewhere else, but Hashem was good to him, and he only gave him a $5,000 bill, water bill. And guess what? From this $5,000 water bill, he goes crazy. He starts screaming at everybody. He gets upset for two, three days. That 5000 is going to now be multiplied to 50000 And then, as long as you continue to resist the pain, that's where the suffering begins. So the amount of, that's why people, because you're not accepting, you're not accepting. Sometimes in life you just have to accept. You get hit, accept. It's for the good. Rav Nachman clearly says, if a person accepts everything that happens to him with happiness, this is a taste of the world to come. So you have to accept, stop resisting pain. I tell people all the time, stop resisting pain. Because it's only going to turn, your suffering just gets greater and greater and greater. You're doing it to yourself. You're doing it to yourself. We have a problem nowadays that I've said, everybody's hitting the mailman for giving them the letter. Everybody's screaming at the mailman. You have to understand where it's all coming from. So if you believe, if you believe that God is good to you, then anything He gives you, you know, it's chesed, it's compassion. If you think God is not good to you, then anything He gives you at the end of the day, you're going to be very depressed. So He says, one of the main reasons why people are so unhappy is that they look at what they have, their mental, physical endowments, their financial and social standings, their academic, career and spiritual, and other accomplished. And what happens? They're grieving because it does not match up with what they think they deserve. Look at that. There's your problem. You're comparing yourself to everybody else, and what you had an idea for your life, it's not matching up. It's not matching up with what, with, with what you thought you were supposed to have. Your expectations were too high. So, there you go. <laughs> Doesn't match. What's going on here? Hashem, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. What's going on here? I'm, not, I'm 32, I'm not married. I'm this, I'm not married. Uh, this one, I don't have the job I want. I don't have the car I want. I don't have this I want. Your expectations are not fit, are not filled. There you go. That's the cause of the major cause of depression. Because who's deciding? He says here, they compare the sums with others, right? And this just what? It just makes it worse and worse and worse. The more you compare yourself to other people, it becomes worse and worse and worse. Essentially, this unhappiness is self-inflicted. It comes from using the wrong standards to evaluate your life. So, there you go. That's one of the major causes. The minute you stop comparing yourself to other people, because you're, everybody comes here in this world with a different mission than this guy. This person has to do this, another person has to do that, another person has to do this, compared to their previous lifetime. So you can't compare yourself to other people. You can't compare yourself to other people because you're going to put yourself in a quick depression. Unfortunately, people spend all day on, on, on instant media watching whatever people have and envying them. Of course. Of course it's going to put you depressed, God forbid. So now you have to understand what's the, one of the major causes. Your standards are not being fit. So, what are you going to do about it? So, there's a lot of people that I see that are crying. A lot of people I, I talk to. A lot of people are in a lot of, they're crying. But I tell people, you're crying over the wrong thing. You're crying for the situation. You should be crying to become better. Stop crying for the situation. If you cry to become better, you know what happens? You're going to get a reward at the end of that cry. Right now you get no reward. You're crying because you don't see life as the way it should be. 
But if you cry to become better, and you cry to become, to get through the situation, and to become stronger, then you get a reward for it. And that's, that's the key. You're crying anyway. One guy gets a reward because he came out of it, and another guy gets nothing. I always told people, write, pretend your life is a movie, write the superhero to the story. Half of it is, is what it happened, write the ending. How would you like the ending to be? How would you like the ending to be? The guy, this happens to him, this happens to him, next thing you know, he becomes a superhero. Write that story for yourself. You have that option. You have that option. So the key is, 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 is the attitude. So it says, unfortunately, and people, they, they erect and build a prison, and they don't even realize they're in a prison. People erect a prison around them, they don't even realize. I told people, you're an Alcatraz. You don't realize you're an Alcatraz, but you're an Alcatraz. You think you're in Miami, you're in San Francisco, my friend. You're in Alcatraz. Huh? Because you're, you're constantly tied to your emotions. That means a person who's constantly emotionally tied to his problems, he can't get out of his emotional problems, he's in, he's in the jail. Because he's never going to accept the way life is given to him. And unfortunately, that's, it's bitterness. Yes, you can have money, you can have that. But if you can't sit there and, and, and be disciplined of your emotions in life, you're going to be miserable. Okay? So it's your decisions, not your conditions, that determine your life. Remember that. There's very rich people that have nothing. And there's very poor people that have all the happiness in the world. So it's your decisions. Your decisions is, what do I focus on in life? What, what, is, what, what do I focus on in life? What do you focus on the half of the day? Do you focus on things you have, or do you focus on things you don't have? What do you focus on? Do you focus on other people's expectations? What do you focus on? So all this is literally literally a spiritual salvation. I'm going to give you guys a huge, huge, huge tip tonight that I think it's one of the... This is literally what caused me to, to break through everything. Is when I was in my situation, and I thank God, Hashem has blessed me with kids, and, and I was uh, a house, and jaw, and thank God companies, etc., etc. And when I was going through my problems, all I could focus was on the problem. Because wherever focus goes, energy flows. So all my focus went on the problem, and I couldn't believe, I couldn't see all the good that I had. I couldn't believe it. I see it now, I'm like, oh my God, how ungrateful was I? I couldn't believe, but why? Because I was emotionally driven. So the day I said, you know when it started becoming over, the whole problem for me? The day I said, thank you for this situation right now. That means, I don't have to be happy tomorrow. I'm happy right now. I'm happy right now. When you say to yourself, I don't have, I'm not married, I'm happy anyway. I don't have kids, I'm happy anyway. I don't have this, I'm happy. Because people think, if I have a new car, I'm going to be happy. If I have a new wife, I'm going to be happy. If I lose 10 pounds, I'm going to be happy. You got the wrong approach. Because after that, something else is going to need to be happy. If you say to yourself, I'm happy right now. I don't care what I have. I don't need a nicer car to be happy. That's real happiness. Because you'll be happy now. And when you get the new thing, you'll be happy. Because you don't need something physical to make you happy. After questions, because this is a long speech. You don't need something else to be happy. And it's just like a kid who's got 10, 10, 10 toys in his room, and he says, I'll be happy if you give me the 11th toy. The parent's gonna go to him, I'm not giving you an 11th toy. Be happy with what you have. Be happy with the 10 toys. You have 10 toys, be happy with the 10 toys. Then, maybe, I will give you an 11th toy. But right now, you don't understand what you're sending in Shemaim. People are sending ungratitude, tremendous amount of ungratitude. Because if you, if you say to yourself, I'll be happy if this happens to me, or I'll be happy if that happens to me, you're, you're gonna be unhappy your whole life. Because what happens if your expectations don't get filled? What do you do? You close up, you come back as another Gilgul, what do you do, what do you do? What do you do? What happens if your expectations don't get met? What are you probably going to do? Not be happy. <laughs> Not be happy. And be ungrateful. And then everything else is going to be ungrateful. So this is a very, very key lesson. And I had to go through a very expensive lesson to realize only when I said thank you for right now. That means I don't care if I finish this problem. I, I don't care if this, this thing gets resolved. I'm happy because I'm going to focus on the things that I have. Not the things I don't have. This is one of the strongest lessons, and I don't understand why people are not screaming this lesson, but at the end of the day, it's nothing. Most people have problems because just good old-fashioned ingratitude. Good old-fashioned ingratitude. 
Stop changing your mezuzahs. Stop asking the rabbi for a Unless you ask the rabbi for a for ungratefulness. <laughs> give me a segula to be, un- to be grateful. If you want to ask a rabbi to give you a segula to be grateful, that will might work. The other ones don't work. Because you have an ungrateful person buying segulot. I've never seen people. I've never seen. They're buying segulot so they can be happy. with. The th- <laughs> what are you, you? You're going to bribe God? I don't understand. I don't understand. And that's, that's exactly what's happening if you're looking at it. But at the, at the end of the day, it's old-fashioned ingratitude. And if you want to make a major change instantly, if you want to have a major, major change in your life instantly, not tomorrow, right away, say, you know what? I changed my whole attitude in life. I said I, I changed everything else in life. I'm going to be happy right now. Once I did that, everything else worked out for itself. Because I said, always said to myself, when this problem is happy, I'm going to be happy. And guess what? I waited a year and a half for that problem. And I'm like, oh my God, how about if it takes another year and a half? I have to be on the sidelines to be happy for another year and a half? This is ridiculous. Something must be wrong. Something must be wrong. So that's, 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 this is a tremendous lesson. If you just came for that, for that little line, that I don't know, that line came to me at Hatzot and his body dude, that this is the key. That's why even the Goyim, they all tell you, you want to change your life, focus on gratitude. Because you can't complain and have gratitude at the same time. This is a very key lesson. It's a very key lesson to realize that I don't need something else to be happy. If you continue with this behavior, you're going to be miserable because you're constantly expecting. You got to turn your expectations into appreciations. Expectations into appreciations. Very simple. Just switch. Switch it. Turn it on and turn it off. Then you're going to see all the things you have in life. And you're going to see all the things, you're going to appreciate the little things in life. But right now, when you're not not focused on that, then you really can't experience those things. So this is one one of the most important lessons I can probably tell you. And that's one of the things that really made the biggest, biggest, biggest change in my life. Okay? So, again... We need to turn this, our expectation to appreciation, okay? So let's talk about Rav Nachman's... What is Rav Nachman considered the purpose of existence, okay? And then we're going to get into Viktor Frankl's book. Okay, so Rav Nachman says very clearly, if a person does not focus on the goal, why is he alive? What's the purpose of you being here tomorrow if you're going to do the same thing today? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of another ungrateful kid? What's the purpose? What, what's, what's the purpose of his existence? If he's not, if he's not going to do nothing for, for the world. What's the purpose of tomorrow if you're going to be the same person today? Think about it. What's the purpose? What happens? There's a, there's a situation in life where you see that what's going on. Your soul is constantly wanting to do the will of the Creator. Your soul is constantly cleaving. He wants to do God's will. It wants to be happy. It wants to do mitzvahs, but your body is destroying it. Your body is creating a huge shadow for your soul. Huge, huge shadow. And that's what's happening today. So look what happens. Is when we see that a person does not want to do the will of God's will, what happens? The soul says, listen, the body doesn't want to go up there, but the soul says, I want to go up there. I'm done. I can't be in this guy's body anymore. It's too much. All day long he's in clubs, all day long he's depressed, all day long he's doing this, he's overeating himself to death, he's, he's, he's in Tavot Niuv, he's in Tavot from Amon, running after money the whole day. The soul says, I can't handle this guy anymore. I can't handle, I need a new person. I need a new person. So what, what happens? She begins to draw herself and depart from the person's body. There's the one major reason for sickness in life. The soul says, I can't be with this guy anymore. Whether he's got ADD, OCD, ABC, whatever Rashi Tevot of uh, people get labeled nowadays. It's this clipo. The soul says, I can't be in this body any longer. This body is con- constantly weakening me. That's not the purpose why I was here. Just like I gave that class today. Your body's not here to sit all day long. Your body's here to move. You're not born, to, you're, you're not created just to sit and play on your phone. You're created to move. So the same thing here. This, what, this is what makes a person sick. Due to the weakening of a soul that results from her drawing herself away from him because he did not do what she wanted. For she wants only to do the will of God 
And there is a contradiction between the battle between the body and the soul. The more you feed your soul, the body's calm. The, the less you be, the feed the soul, the body needs a tavot. <laughs> this is an old-fashioned formula. If a person is able to have a healthy spiritual life, he can have a physical life, he can drive a nice car, he can have a nice house, he can enjoy his life, he can enjoy, I'm not telling you to become a mom and move to Tiberias and, and, and learn all day, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you that if you do not feed your soul, your body is going to break down because your soul is going to leave your body. So what is he saying here? That a person is restored to health by the means of medication is the result of the soul seeing now he sees, look, he's taking medication, so he wants to, he's, he's finally taking care of his body. He looks like he wants to live. So what happens? Because he's accustomed to eating bread and foods, and, overcoming, and now he has to overcome his desire by taking bitter medications. So the bitterness of the medications, and the bitterness of the, of the treatment that people go through when they're sick, it actually elevates their soul. That's why you fast. When you fast, what do you do when you fast? You're only feeding the soul. The body gets nothing. <laughs> That's why when people have a bad dream, what do you do? You have to fast. What do you do? Why do, why do, why would, when there's major gets a rot and call you strong, when there's major gets a rot in life, what, what do we get called for? We get called to fast. Because we need to give the, the soul a boost. Because the body's like, listen, I'm, I'm 90 10. <laughs> you got to be at least 50 50. If you're 90 10, body, 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 and all your day long you're feeding your body, and you show up to a Friday night class and you say, Shalom Aleichem, you're giving your body, you're giving your soul very little. And eventually, you're going to have no meaning in your life, and you're going to turn to addictions, you're going to turn to other forms of things to make you happy, or you're just going to be a very, very bitter person. We all know them. We all know bitter people. But we, say, we tell them, why don't you try to get some spirituality? Why don't you try to work on your soul? No, it's not for me. It's not for me. Okay, that's what you chose. So what happens, major, unfortunately, nowadays, including me, we all get religious when we have rough things happen to us. Nobody's, uh, nobody just gets a, an email, be religious. Everybody here probably got religious because something happened in their life. They had a little saras and they said, you know what? I'm down and out. I got to turn to God. Let's be honest. That's what happens usually nowadays. But at least, what are you doing? You're finally feeding your soul. So if you're feeding your soul, then your body has a chance to live. And then you can live. And then you can be happy. As long as there's a balance between the body and the soul, there's a balance. That's why people are successful at the end of the day. The only way they find happiness is when they start giving to other people. They find meaning in their life. You see big, big people, big CEO, only when they tie themselves to giving charity or giving something where they feed their soul, do, now they have a purpose of existence. Now they can say, well, we're making all this money, but we're making all this money to give it away. Or we're, making, or we're doing this to give it away. To do it. That's the key. So he says, if a, once a person is restored, then that's the key. So your purpose in this world is to do the will of God. That's the purpose of this world, is to do God's will. And at the end of the day, he says, lesson four, Rabbi Nachman says, it should make no difference to you. Clearly, he says, either a person is judged by the name Yudke Vavke or the name Elohim. Okay? So he says, when a person knows that everything that happens for him is for his benefit, this is, the per this is the perception of the taste of the world to come. When you know that everything that's happened to you, it's absolutely for your best, then you have the world to come. Then you know, you're living, you know what, what's the difference? I was supposed to lose this money, it wasn't meant to happen, if I didn't lose it here, I lost it in something else, I was supposed, this was supposed to happen, I wasn't supposed to work here. We have millions of stories how people all of a sudden you hear a story of Steve Jobs telling that he got thrown out of Apple because he got thrown out of Apple. Why? Because he had to came, come out with Pixar and he had to come out with Next. Every story you hear, there's not one CEO story you don't hear that there was a situation where they had a tremendous breakdown where they thought no, there's no hope and they had the resiliency to come back. Every CEO story. I, can't, I don't remember one of them that's not like that. That a guy who made it, he had that moment where he thought... The worst thing happened to him, but he somehow he found the will and he found the way to come back. That's what you guys have to do. That's what people have to do. They have to wait for that comeback. Not be on the sidelines. That means you're going to get called on to make that comeback. But unfortunately, if you're on the sidelines, depressed, where is the guy? We called him out. Come. No, he's, he's depressed. Oh, he missed a shot. That's what happens. That's the danger of becoming depressed. Because you're never going to get that, that turnaround. So if you realize that God is good to you, I say every single day, God is good to me. 
Rabbi Nachman has another Torah that clearly says, Ve'ahavta l'recha kamocha. Love your friend as much as, but what is he really saying? Ve'ahavta l'recha. Love the raw. Love the raw that's coming to you. Love the bad that's coming to you. Because at the end of the day, compared to what you really deserve, you deserve a lot, a lot more. Because God is compassionate. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to punish his children. But sometimes people need to get smacked over the face. Because they won't, they won't get the lesson if they just get a pat in the back. First he gives you a pat in the back. And then if you're not getting that lesson, then he smacks you. I know me, I got smacked. Heavy duty. But if it wasn't for that smack, I wouldn't be doing what my purpose in life is to do. I wouldn't know what my purpose is. If you don't get yourself out of the comfort zone, Hashem will get you out of your comfort zone very quickly. But that's going to be very painful. That's going to be very painful. So the key is, once you know that Yud Kevavke, which is Hashem's name, and Elohim, which is the name of judgment, is one, it's all coming from one. When we say every single day, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. It's the same Shema Echad. It's all one. It's the same God of Elokeinu and Yud Kevavke. It's the same God. It's not two gods punishing you. It's one God. Sometimes people see, whoa, what's going on in my life? No, but it's the same God. Once you understand that, then you realize, wow, I'm getting off a bargain. Every time I get hit, I got a deal. I say to myself, I got a deal. Because I'm not going to complain. Because if I complain, guess what? Then I'm resisting the deal. And then I start getting hit harder and harder. So first, God forbid, you lose this, then you lose that, then you lose that, and then you lose that. That's what I'm trying to get people to change. They're to accept whatever God's given them and to stop complaining and crying. If you're going to cry, cry to become better. Don't cry for the problem. That will give you no reward. When did you get, did you ever hear the guy, you go, wow, look at the depressed person of the year. He's the depressed person of the year. Did you ever hear such a thing? No. It's all about the comeback. Everybody loves the comeback. So now we're going to talk about Viktor Frankl, okay? Beautiful book he came out, okay? And we're going to talk about his main concepts in his book. His main concept in his book was the fact that his whole will is a person's, a person's happy when it has meaning in his life. Where Freud was, purpose, per, a person's purpose is for what? Desire. And Adler's purpose was what? To become powerful. So that's why he had a, a big fight and he was about to quit. Before we go into to, to, to his story, you should know that he was about to quit. He sold 10 million copies of his book. 10 million copies across the world. I think every therapy nowadays uses logotherapy. The Lubavitcher Rebbe came to him. Unbelievable story before we start this. There's a story. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, he was about to quit. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe had a, a common friend that he says, by the way, if you're going to Vienna, I need, you to, I need you to visit Viktor Frankl. This is before Viktor Frankl was really famous. And he told, he sent somebody to send her, I believe her name is Margaret Charles, Margaret Charles or something, and he sent a message with her. And she went all the way to Vienna, and she, the Lubavitcher Rebbe told Viktor Frankl, sent a message, this is a message from, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, do not stop your work. Your work is going to be very powerful, and it's going to help out millions of people. Look at the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he had the insight on how, how important this concept is today. Look at the Lubavitcher Rebbe, how, how, how the Tzadikim had this concept. So life is what? Life is 10% the problem, and 90% your attitude towards the problem. Life is 10% the problem, 90% your attitude towards the problem. So he was, he was a psychiatrist who suffered through the Holocaust. Okay? And he realized that no matter what, nobody could demoralize him, nobody could take his freedom on what he focused on. Nobody could take his freedom on what his, what, what his will was. So Viktor Frankl was able to, to do the su biggest suffering of pain and be able already to see himself out. That was the greatness of Viktor Frankl. To realize, to go through so much pain in your life and to be able already to see yourself out. So they realized the people who survived, the, many people who survived the Holocaust when they didn't, the ones who survived were the ones that were able to find meaning to their suffering. And they were able to see, after the Holocaust, I'm going to reunite with a loved one. I'm going to reunite, reunite with somebody. And that was the key. If the person already had a goal that he was getting out, he was getting out. Which is, the same thing. Right. Which is, that was the major key. The people who gave up, God forbid, they, they, they died with Hashem Shemayim. 
But the people who had a will to live, that's why if a person's in, in their own particular problem, as long as the person has a will to live, has a will, meaning in his life, has a purpose for everything, then at the end of the day, nothing bothers him. Because <laughs> he's feeling God's will. That's the key. So what are the main, main concepts of, this, of Viktor Frankl's book? Says, everything can be taken away from you. Everything can be taken away but one thing. Your attitude towards any situation. That means nobody can take away your attitude. No matter what situation. I was involved in the worst situation. Once I changed my attitude that I was deciding to be happy right now, not when this is over, not when I do this, that's when my attitude, I, was able, I got a new burst of life. And I didn't care when the thing was over today or tomorrow. Because I said to myself, I don't need something else to be happy. Once you need something else to be happy, then you're always going to be waiting for that thing to happen. And it's like waiting for, a, for waiting for a train to come that's never going to come. Because guess what? Ungrateful people don't get their, what they want. You have to give God a reason to give you something. And ingratitude is, num- is the one reason not to give it to you. So everything can be taken away from a man but one thing, your freedom of what you focus on. Second concepts. At the moment of such pain, it's not the physical pain that hurts. It's the mental agony is the problem. It's not the, the divorce. It's not the this. It's the mental agony. It's the mental agony that depletes a person. We gave a share two days ago on 12 effects of stress on your brain. 12 effects of stress on your brain, what stress does to your brain. It shrinks your brain. You know your brain is made of neuroplasticity, that your brain can actually expand and, 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 and actually become smaller. We have a class on SoundCloud. I gave 12 reasons on how you can lose your memory from, from stress, prolonged stress, God forbid, creates radicals, creates toxifications, all kinds of things. Tremendous amount of cortisol. What happens, that's what Rabbi Nachman says, do not do tshuva on Mocham Gadlu. Don't do tshuva when you're depressed. You won't be able to, because you won't have the head to get out of it. You need to do tshuva when you're Mocham Gadlut. When you're Mocham Gadlut, when you have expansion. When you have expansion of intellect, oh, now I realize that I was ungrateful. When I was, uh, when I was in that problem, I'm in Mocham Gadlut. I'm the victim. I can't see the good. You can't do tshuva then. Because you're, you're not in the state to do tshuva. You're in the state of Mocham Gadlut. That name is Elohim. That's the guy who's ungrateful, so he's going to get one judgment after another judgment until he realizes, whoa, let me realize what I'm doing is not working. So you have to do tshuva on mochem gadlut. Mochem gadlut, you have to, that's yurkei vavke. That's the name of expansion. So if a person is able to do tshuva, he's got to do tshuva on the yurkei vavke. On the elokim, he won't be able to do tshuva. That's why you have to have mochem gadlut. You have mochem gadlut, which is higher intellect, is only through happiness. Only through happiness. Listen to what he's saying here. So it's, again, it's the mental agony that's destroying you. It's not the snake bite, it's the, it's the venom, it's the emotions, it's the fear of the future, it's the amalek. It's the thinking you're never going to get out. That's what's affecting the people. Okay? Listen to this. Unbelievable, unbelievable line. I've, I've used some of these lines that are unbelievable. In some way, like we said, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment you find meaning like we just spoke about before. The minute you find the purpose, the minute you realize this Gamzula Tava, that's when everything else is gone. Everything, all of the suffering disappears in one shot. Like I told you, there's, how many stories do I know? I tell people that were in drug addiction. You know, if you didn't go through this drug addiction, you would be, never be connected to Rabbi Nachman. And nowadays you're doing one hour of his bodhidu today. For you to get to an hour of his bodhidu today, you have no idea how high the level is. If you would have never gone through this addiction, you would have never even thought about it. How many people I, nowadays that are there, there are people in addiction that are now teaching classes to 40, 50 people in AA that I see? If you never would have gone through this addiction, you would have never been teaching classes in AA. You would never find the purpose of your life. But you have to go through that, through that situation to feel another person's pain. So that his whole life makes sense to him. He doesn't, he's not even focused on addiction anymore. He's not even focused on relapse because he, now he knows his purpose of life. His purpose of life is to help other people deal with addiction because another person cannot talk the same language as another person who's on heroin and, and, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning because that guy hasn't been on heroin at 3 o'clock in the morning. But this guy has and he knows how to get to his brain. So people go through, once you realize the meaning that you had, this whole purpose was, 
was to do this, or, 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 or uh, Shiduch broke up with one girl. And I, I know people that are depressed because somebody didn't, didn't text them a message, an email, half an hour. Oh my God, this girl doesn't like me anymore. I'm depressed. <laughs> are you kidding? Don't force it. Maybe that's not the one for you. You're forcing something to happen. You're, you're trying to put a, a square in a circle, shoving it, shoving it. Maybe it's not supposed to happen. That's why you have to have emuna. Emuna is to know that everything that happens for you is for the best. If it's not, this girl wasn't supposed to marry you. It's funny, Rabbi Nachman talks about that sometimes a person has to meet four or five people in a shidduch before he meets his, 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 his bride. And the dates are part of getting to the goal. <laughs> so if you understand the dot, if you understand the knowledge that all suffering is one thing, is a lack of dot. The only reason why a person <coughs> suffers is because he has no knowledge of why this is happening for him. If he has the knowledge, why do you need to suffer? That's the key. He says, listen to this line. Unbelievable line. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Million dollar line. There you go. When you can't change a situation, when you can't change it, no matter how much you cry, now you have to challenge yourself to change the situation. You have to change that situation. And see the situation differently. Major concept. Because people are doing what? They're trying to change the situation. And guess what? It's not changing. You have to become stronger. That's why I tell people, life does not get easier. You have to become stronger. If you're expecting life to get easier, you're just going to wait and wait and wait. It's not happening. It's not happening. There's more and more things to focus on, God forbid, in this world. But if he knows, if he focuses on becoming stronger, learning Torah, talking to God, then at the end of the day, he's just as strong as his Yetzirah. And he can deal with life. But when you, when you have no Torah, when you have no, no, you're not feeding the soul, yeah, you, something happens, you don't know where to run. Rav Nachman clearly says in wisdom that a person who has no Muna has no life. You think he has a life, but he doesn't have a life. It looks like he has a life, but deep down he's not, he doesn't have a life. Because he doesn't know, where, who, do, who do I turn to in this problem? Where do I go? Where do I go? We, I know, thank God, I'm fortunate to do his bodhidhut every day. I have a problem, I know where I go. I have an appointment every, every morning, four, five, six o'clock in the morning, I talk to God about the problem, that's it, that's all I have to do. I empty out the problem, here you go God, this is the problem I have. Teach me how to become better in the situation. Not, don't change the situation. See, people are trying to pray for a situation to change without them changing in the situation. Do you understand that that's like completely impossible to happen? You can't change God. You can change your, your perception. That means if you understand, you go to Mohim Gadlut. The person goes to higher intellect, then he's able to understand life. So again, when you are no longer able to change the situation, we, must, we are challenged to change ourselves. So if you're not focusing on constant tshuva, how are you getting out of any situation? That means you have to realize that you viewed the situation, I viewed the situation, how did I change my situation? I, view, I view, realized that I had tremendous amount of ingratitude. I didn't realize how much ingratitude I had at that moment. I didn't see it, because when you're in a storm, you can't see when you're in the storm. Why? Because there's a storm. <laughs> you can't see in a storm, when you're in a storm, you're in a storm. So you can't see it. So once I was able to, to, to realize, wow, this is not going away. The more I complain, the more I, I focus on attorneys, the more I focus on this, the more I focus on that, this problem is not going away. It's not going away. Then I said, you know what? I'm just going to pretend it's over. And I'm going to be happy right now. And then, all of a sudden, this was over, that was over, that was over, that was over. It was like the magic wand opening up. So I said, wow, I can't believe what happens when you have ingratitude. Because ingratitude is really a form of gava. It's the ego. The ego is not accepting. How could you? You gave charity, you did this, you, this is what you should go through? Why me? Why is, that's what, why is, happen, why is life happening to me? It's a famous line with Tony Rums. It's happening for you. It's happening for you, not to you. If you think life is happening to you, victim. If you think life is happening for you, it's an opportunity. So when you, this is such an important line. 
Stop focusing on situations to change. Start focusing on you to change, to view the situation differently, and start changing your focus to focusing on what you don't have to focusing on what you do have. You could, you could solve the whole singles problem today by all of a sudden everybody being happy with themselves. That means they don't have the pressure of the marriage. I have a pressure, now I'm gonna date, oh my God, it's, I'm 27, I'm 35, I'm not married yet. So they're going into the dates, frigidity, they're, they're, they don't know what to do, they're, they're just, they're all banged up. If they were happy with themselves, Hashem, if this is meant for the Shidduch, it's meant to be, if this not, it'll be somebody else, whatever you send me is for my best anyway. I'm not going to sit there and try to force, oh, we have to get married now. We have to get married now. If we don't get married, I'm going to be 28. If I'm 28, what's going to happen to me? I'm gonna, what are people going to think of me? Who cares what people think of you? Who cares? Who cares what people think of you? The minute you stop caring what people think of you, then you have freedom. The minute you worry about what people think of you, you have no freedom. You're going to marry the wrong person because of what people think of you. You're going to get into the wrong profession because you're the wrong what people think of you. Sometimes people get into the wrong professions because they oh, oh, no, he can't be that. He has to make everybody happy. So I have to do this, something I completely do not like. So I'm going to be miserable because I'm going to make everybody else happy. You think that's going to make you happy at the end of the day? No. That's where you spend 90% of your life, at work. Do go to work and do something you don't like to do, you're going to be very depressed. I guarantee you. Okay? <laughs> So he says something very deep, which, I, which I've responded, which I spoke about many times. Everybody has a, a situation, an event, okay? So he says, between the event, you have two responses. You can either respond, or you can react, and depending on whether you respond or you react, the outcome is completely different. We have a lot of people reacting. When you react, what happens? What, do you usually, what happens usually when you react? You get what? You get angry. You get emotional. You just say whatever's on your mind. Did you ever apologize to somebody the way, I'm sorry the way I responded to you. You never apologize, yeah? I'm sorry the way I reacted to the situation. When did you ever apologize for responding to a situation? Did you ever say, I'm sorry the way I responded? <laughs> no, because that means you have to think about it. If I respond, I have to think. That means I don't just answer to anybody. First I think about it. Something, somebody's attacking me. Okay, I see this person's in a lot of pain. Right? This person's in a lot of pain. So I view them. They're just screaming because they had a rough day. If I, go into, if I join that emotional drama, guess what? I'm going to react and I'm going to say, leave me alone, do this. I'm going to, go, I'm going to join that, 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 that nonsense. If I respond, I stop. Who tells you you have to react or respond? Who, is there a timeline when I have to respond? I can take four seconds to respond, five seconds. I don't have to respond when you want to respond. This is a very big key in Shalom Bayit. Because Shalom Bayit, they're going to ask you what? Where were you? What do you care where I was at? What do you care? I was, what do you think I was? What do you think that is? Reaction. Response. I have nothing to do. I was here. I was here. I was, it's like a customer. Customer's complaining. Okay. No problem. We'll see how we make it better. Guess what happens if you see a guy screaming at a customer? What do you think if you ever see a salesman screaming at a customer? Sounds like this guy's a hothead. You don't scream at a customer. Who screams at a customer? A guy who doesn't have a job anymore. <laughs> so your outcome in life is going to be what? Based on your, your space between the event and how you respond or react. If you start responding to things in life, you're going to become much better and you're going to regret a lot less. You're going to regret a lot less. We know all anger comes from a reaction. Guess what? Rav Nachman clearly says in Lesson 59, before Shefa comes down to a person, he's going to be get tested with anger to see how he Response. He's tested. It's a test. If you blow it, Shefa goes to the other side. If you keep it, that Shefa, you get that Shefa. So you have to be able to, to be in the moment of not reacting all the time. Animals react. Humans respond. You have that, I respond. This will save you Shalom Bayit. This will save your work. This will save you everything. Because you, you, you might need to take two, three seconds left. 
So that's a, a very important concept that he came out with. The a person's ability to respond or react to a situation. Very, very big concept. <laughs> you understand, these lessons, that I'm get, these lessons are major lessons for life. I mean, these are major keys for, to life. So if you think about everything, situation in your past, what, how you responded or reacted, you could say, oh my God, I regret, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. Stop saying I can't believe it and start working on your, put a pause button between the question and think. Okay, now, now I will respond at my pace. I, my emotions are not going to discipline me. I'm going to be disciplined over my emotions. If my emotions discipline me, then I have no life. So he says here, you have to live as if you were already living for a second time. Beautiful concept. Imagine you, were, you already saw your life in a movie. How would you live the second time? How would you live the second time? You would change a lot of things, wouldn't you? A lot. You would change a lot of things. Yeah. If you would come here a second time, say pretend right now you're living in a second time, how would you, how would you see the life differently? Deep concepts. How would you see life differently? You would change a lot of things. I know I would change a lot of things. I would change a lot of ingratitude that I did in the past. I would change a lot of complaining that I did for no reason. I would definitely change a lot of things. So he says, he who has, this is also by another person came out, Victor Frank, he who has a why to live for can bear anyhow. If you have a why, if you have a purpose to life, no matter what happens, you can bear it. If I know this is my dream business, I don't care what happens. If there's a permit, if there's this problem, if there's that problem. Because this is my dream business. This is my dream. I mean, I'll do anything for this business. Your why has to be bigger than your how. When your how is bigger than your why, you have no, nothing accomplished. Major concept. Your why has to be bigger than your how. You have to have a why. Why do you get up every morning? Why do you get up every morning? What's your purpose? That's, that's, that's what makes you get up. Otherwise, you're going to get people calling you. Wake me up. Wake me up at 10. Wake me up at 10. Put the snooze button. Because the guy has no reason to wake up. Nobody has to wake me up in the morning. I already have a way to live. I have, I have many purposes to live. So I don't need to get waking up. Here, come to Chuva. Come, come learn Torah. You don't have to push me to learn Torah. You don't have to push me to do exercise. You don't have to push me to do these things. Because I already have a why. Once you have the why, you don't need help from anybody. If you don't know it, then you have a problem. Okay? So, the bottom line is, is these, are, these are major, major concepts. And, 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 and if, you, if a person starts realizing that it's all about your attitude. It's all about your attitude in a situation. If a person is able to realize his attitude, that our job in this world is to get to the world to come. I know it doesn't sound so fancy, who wants to get to the world to come? I don't want to worry about this world. But your job is to get to the world to come. If you realize, on, 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 instead of having, being, in, being more, working on your soul, getting closer to God, that's then at the end of the day, the materialism at the end of the day, you're not going to be chasing like everybody else. And you're not going to have this triad of, of uh, a midlife crisis when you're 45, 30, 50, going to a doctor and asking him, I have everything, but I don't know why I'm here. I have everything, but I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. You, you're going to a doctor to tell you why you're here. How many psychiatrists? I don't know why I'm here. Because you didn't feed your soul. And that's the problem. So it's not, unfortunately, nowadays, people realize, they, re they think, oh, if I get close to God, if I start becoming breastfed, if I start getting religious, I'm going to be downgrading my, my life. They think, I'm going to be downgrading my life. This is going to, now I'm going to be weaker, I'm going to be overweight, I'm going to be dressed differently. Who says that? Who says that? Getting close to God is one of the most empowering things you can get in life. This is in your head telling you this. Who's telling you that? This is in your head. This is why people are afraid to get close to God. Because they think, oh, I'm not going to be cool anymore. I'll have to dress differently. Who's telling you this? Who's telling you this? Stop telling yourself nonsense. A person can, can get close to God, and that's the only way he's going to be able to, to fight his Yetzirah. Because if not, your Yetzirah is going to over, overcome you, God forbid, and overtake your life. And this is not what you want. Alright? That's, that's today's class. Uh, yes, go ahead.